Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's topic, which we will be talking about the future of retail and hospitality. Uh, we have two guests on today that are going to lead our lively discussion. Uh, for those of you that are watching live on Facebook, um, feel free to use the comment feature and you can join in the discussion. Um, if you're watching this post uh, June 5th, um, then you're watching it uh, in not a live setting, uh, but hopefully you'll get uh, some value out of it. Uh, I wanna invite our guests in, Philippe Schramm from Buffalo Wings and Rings and David Birdsall. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, what I would love is, Philippe, I'm gonna start with you. You wrote this paper, it's live on 1851. It's titled White Paper, Call in the Future of Retail and Hospitality. I would love for you to put some framework around it and just some generalistic thoughts that you want to start with. And then, David, I'll go to you. But, Philippe, let's start with you on this one. Okay, yes. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending on your time zone. Uh, I am Philippe Schramm. I am the chairman of uh, Buffalo Wings and Wing. We are uh, a casual dining chain of restaurants focusing on uh, better food uh, than our competition uh, with the sports uh, also played in our restaurant. I've always had a lot of interest for the past and the future. And I think somewhere I am very lucky in my business because I have a business partner who is very good uh, in today, in the today. So together uh, we are a very good match. A future being a, a, a huge interest of mine, uh, I thought it would be uh, interesting to collect uh, information about the future. And when I say future, it's not just, it's not tomorrow, it's more 2021 and beyond and being able to share that uh, with people who are also interested by future. We appreciate that. David, do you want to give some opening statements too on what you're thinking about as it relates to the future? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, David Birdsall. I'm the uh, uh, co-founder and managing partner of Last Mile Investments. It's an investment fund uh, focused on uh, buying small neighborhood, uh, unanchored shopping centers, uh, in the Midwest and the Southeast. Uh, I've been a veteran uh, retail shopping center owner and developer for 25 years. Um, so I've seen uh, my share of uh, retail um, catastrophes and resurgence uh, through the years. And uh, the nice thing that I always kind of love about my business and about retail in particular is that it's creatively destructive um, and it eats its own. So, you know, we're seeing it, we're in a epicenter of some creative destruction right now. Uh, I, I call this the great accelerator uh, in the evolution of, of retail. Um, and I think it's actually exciting times ahead uh, once we get past this. So um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm also a board member of uh, Buffalo uh, Wings and Rings. I really appreciate the term, the, the accelerator. So when, when you're thinking of that, and, and, and really to put into context, so many businesses have spent the last few months getting things done that would have taken them years to get done in a very micro and sprint mentality. What are some of the accelerators that are gonna happen from the retail sector that you see that could be happening in the future? Sure, I mean, number one is the people that should not be around won't be around anymore. Um, and, you know, whether that's large scale apparel only department stores uh, or whether that's, um, you know, a uh, concepts that uh, really were just kind of hanging on, uh, you know, that, that'll accelerate, you know, their demise. Uh, but I think also what, what we're seeing and what we think is interesting is retail went through a resurgence in the 90s and the 2000s, we called it the great age of expansion of big box, and now everybody's shrinking. And what you've seen is they want to be in the neighborhood. So boxes are going to become smaller. Um, online certainly is a factor, but online is very, very expensive. So stores, you know, what, what we've seen here are stores are important and they're going to continue to be important uh, for, you know, for the retailers. And then the third thing is, is it's going to accelerate, you know, the, you know, for the restaurants in particular, and Philippe can speak more to this, but, you know, multiple models. I think you're going to see the rise of ghost kitchens, which will be less expensive for people to build out. 
where they can have delivery in multiple uh, markets. Uh, and I think you're going to uh, uh, see the importance of the drive through and uh, in a lot of communities, drive throughs aren't allowed by way of zoning. So I think you're going to see some, you know, acceleration from that standpoint on the importance of having, uh, you know, the ability to serve your customer in multiple, multiple ways. All right, Philippe, based on what David's saying and, and me knowing you on a, on a personal and professional level, this is stuff that you've been thinking about for a while. Does does a COVID situation accelerate your progress as a brand? Um, does this does this shake things up a little bit so that you're you're owning the opportunity? What's on your what's your mindset as it relates to now being the time to address some of these moves that that you've probably predicted could happen for quite some time? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, every other week, I speak with about fifteen different brands. We we are sharing. Uh, it's a mind sharing to understand. Uh, what are the best de decisions to make in those times? And clearly, I hear a lot from uh, industry peers that projects that would have taken three to six months are realized, are achieved and delivered in two to three weeks. Uh, so very likely, the speed is there, uh, and it's uh, about four or five times faster than what we used to, uh, to see before. It also happened now, if I am speaking uh, specifically about uh, Buffalo Wings and Rain. We uh, started two years ago the new prototype, the prototype, the prototypical unit of the 2020s. And this prototype had all the elements that uh, uh, David Bertel mentioned uh, the, the drive through, the pickup window. Um, a, a, a smaller model, much more integrated uh, with all the electronic platform, the ability to order online. So for us, the good thing, and it's also uh, it's a perfect timing, as the economy is reopening, we have the prototype which is ready to be de delivered to match the 2020s expectations. David, when, when you're sitting in the seat as a, as a board member, part of, I'm sure, what you do is you're advising where some of this stuff could go. If, if you're sitting on a board of a brand that's watching right now and, and is listening to Philippe and you talk and is like, you guys are right, we need to be thinking about the future as it relates back to our brand. One, is it too late? Two, when, when would it be too late? Oh, I uh, no, I don't think it's too late at all. I mean, this this is the great reset, right? I mean, everybody's getting, you know, a pass not only to close stores and and rethink themselves, um, especially on the public company side, uh, but also you know to 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 re to reallocate resources for the future, and nobody's going to get punished for it. And you know, I think some brands, you know, that you know can think of new ways to serve their customer or really discover who their customer is are going to have tremendous opportunities because you know landlords you know need tenants i think it's reset the landlord tenant relationship especially in the smaller businesses um because frankly you know they they've actually been the 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 winners or i shouldn't say they they <laughs> some of the larger retailers have been the bad actors the small franchise re re retailers have been actually great you know, to deal with, you know, as we've seen in our portfolio. So no, I would be encouraging to, you know, now is the time to, you know, really think uh, about the gift that you've been given. Um, may not feel like that, but, you know, the chance to reset um, and think about the future and how the customer is going to be served. And maybe some of those things that you thought were important aren't important anymore. And uh, you're going to be able to, you know, capitalize on that uh, and think and think through that. Philippe, you start off the the paper that you that you wrote, which is on 1851 right now. If you search for the future of retail and hospitality, you'll find Philippe's paper. But you started off with the category of leadership, and if I think about leadership and where leadership has failed, the easiest case study that I can point to is the 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 boardroom of Blockbuster when someone's like, 
hey, you guys should buy Netflix. And they're like, nope, we've done it this way forever. So to avoid getting blockbustered, it's going to take smart leadership that, that appears. How important is it for leadership to be discussing directions of the future, not only just seizing the opportunities, but also recognizing the threats of what could happen to general business? So, yeah, I, I think it's critical. I have a say, I call, I call it today and tomorrow. So you need to be very good at today. And this is the operation and the execution. So from your CEO to your entire operation department and marketing and managing the PNL, the finance, this is very important. But you need also in the DNA of the leadership and the board uh, to have people who spend time in the future. Uh, the, the reason why uh, I have uh, suggested that Dave participates to the discussion today is that out of the board member is always the one who is speaking the most about the future. Uh, Dave has been with us now for uh, more than six years, and he has been proven right in the way he is uh, viewing the future. So, as you can see, uh, at all the levels in our organization, we have this combination of today and the future. I mentioned my partner, uh, Nader Massade, so between Nader and I, I think we complement each other very well. Our executive team, we have also the same mix. And then with the board, we have four board members, and some are better in the today, and some are better in the future. And we make sure that in the agenda, uh, we, uh, we have topics uh, that are booked and that are discussed about the future. So we speak a lot about 2030, 2025, um, being a company which is owned by two individuals only without banks uh, and uh, without loans, actually, almost without loans, uh, we don't have a lot of short-term pressures so that allows us to make decisions that are very good for the long term of the bond. I think I think there's a very important to call out there that when you when you're running, you you position the business from a financial standpoint to be very stable. Therefore, when when a black swan event hits, which this would be considered one, um, you are prepared to be mentally strong to figure out how do we recover and how do we seize the opportunity? Is that is that an accurate positioning? Yeah, this is an accurate positioning and uh, I can give an example. So uh, my partner and I, we have always been very careful with the money uh, to uh, accumulate cash reserves. And today, as you say, you know, it, it's, a, it's a black swan event. And we have been using some of the reserves so that uh, we could be able to work through that difficult period. Actually, we have not laid off any employees from the corporate office because immediately we have recognized that there was a lot of work to be delivered in the short term, but also for the long term. Uh, for example, the long term, we are still building our prototypical unit. Uh, we are implementing uh, a new POS system. We are implementing new uh, IT platform, which are going to be able to better manage the relationship between the guest uh, and, and the brand, a new menu item. And of course, all that costs a lot of money in a period where the income is lower. So again, you know, the long-term approach is there all the time uh, between my... Uh, my business partner and myself and all the staff of Buffalo Wings and Wings. Thank you for that. With this being a discussion, um, I want to bring in a question from our audience. I'm going to go ahead and put that on the screen so both of you can see it. This is from Robert Crisani, who is uh, the CEO of IFA, the International Franchise Association. Is there a danger of overcorrection in restaurants moving to drive through delivery, and ghost kitchens? How do you keep from fighting the the last war and transitioning to the future while keeping in touch with what makes your brand special. Uh, David, do you want to take a first swing at sure. that? Sure. You know, we have another board member, Jerry Kaufman. He has a great <clears throat> long history in branding and he has a 
very simple, you know, saying, he says, a brand is the promise of an experience. And not everybody's going to switch to drive through and it doesn't work, you know, for, for, for everybody. Uh, and it doesn't work for, um, uh, it certainly doesn't work in the fine dining. It certainly doesn't work in the higher end restaurants. Uh, and so you have to, so yes, there was always a danger of overcorrecting. Um, but I think it's just one more way to serve your, you know, serve your customer. And, you know, because the customer wants in the case of BWR, you know, the customer wants, you know, their, their food, their wings. I think they've, they've clearly become the category, uh, in it. And the ghost kitchen, I think is an interesting concept It remains to be seen, but what it does is it gives you, if they, if, if the delivery experience is, is, is correct, and, and meaning that they own the experience of, you know, when you, when you buy an Apple product, the experience in the box, the packaging and the, and the way that it's, uh, you know, delivered to you, that's almost an experience in and of itself. And if that can get controlled from the ghost kitchens, it can expand your opportunity to serve the customer where a restaurant may not make sense. So that's where I think the opportunities lie. Uh, at very at very low cost, by the way, so uh, or at less cost, I should say. Um, and I think it's gonna uh, I think it's gonna evolve. And Philippe, do you want to provide some insight on the question as well? Yeah. So uh, well, I think it's a very good question. Uh, so the, the the brand today has a positioning, and the key word here is flexibility. So we need to have multiple channels to be able to uh, serve our customers. It's, very, it's extremely difficult actually to predict the future. But if you are flexible and you execute well your different channels, uh, then you are going to see uh, which one connects with the customers. Uh, I completely agree with uh, Robert's comment. I would be very careful to abandon uh, the positioning where you have been extremely successful to go for something which is uh, uh, more risky and, and perhaps not that good for the brand. So you, you can try to prototype on the side and see how it resonates with the guest. And if there is a positive connection, then you can continue to grow that channel. So I think that the key word here is to be flexible. Before we move off of the foundational positioning of how, how do you even prepare for the future and how do you how do you have the, this discussion, uh, I would love both of your opinions on this. It seems that one, Philippe, you just said it that predicting the future is extremely difficult, and and that that's why that's that, 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 that's probably why the the future is always talked about because it's hard to predict what what is what is going to happen. But additionally. When when changes happen within an organization it, that that are aggressive, whether it's going pivoting completely into a ghost kitchen or completely reshaping your brand based on current day situations, when what has worked well in the past has established you to be what you are today, um, this this stress test happens and pushes brands into to experimenting with things that can ultimately derail them. What advice would you have for businesses that may have not positioned themselves financially strong for this moment that are feeling the pressures and the stress that are forcing them to almost say, hands up, I'm willing to do something else? Uh, Philippe, do you want to you want to go first on that? Yeah. So, uh, for example, when you read the book uh, about uh, Jim Collins, the, the Good to Great and the other books that he has written, he always advises uh, to uh, shoot uh, so some small bullets before shooting the big cannonball. So one, you need to be realistic on the number of projects that you can lead at one time. And uh, uh, very often, less is better, uh, less is more. Uh, then uh, discuss with your surrounding. One of the things that we are doing a lot is that we accumulate a lot of customer data, third party data. For example, what I, I love with our uh, VP of marketing is that she never says, I want that, or in my opinion, she's always saying, the guests are saying that to us, so we should continue to invest in that, in that direction. So a very uh, 
uh, customer center organization which is going to uh, shoot the small bullet first in the direction that has been indicated by the guest and then make the, the bigger uh, bigger impact with the, the big bullet. And David, opinions on that? Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, one thing I've learned here in COVID, uh, which I learned early on, is that nobody knows anything, which was very freeing. Then I didn't have to watch a bunch of webinars. Uh, so, but I, I would tell you, you know, we're in a we're we're in an opportunity here. Um, you know, I, I always follow the Charlie Munger rule of trying to get multiple mental models in how to look at things. And you, the, one of the great things is that is that data, data is so much more accessible now. And actually the ability to parse that data is actually acceptable. So we're starting to use AI um, based decisions. I, I shouldn't say they're based, but they certainly are influenced by the data that, that, we, can, that we can generate to make sure that you know, the, the small bullet is gonna, is gonna be effective. And from that, so from that, so from that standpoint, I, I agree with I agree with Philippe. I mean, you don't want to give up your your brand that you've built, uh, but you you also can't be afraid to you know to, to innovate and take other ideas. And Ch Chipotle, for an example, I think is it's probably a good example, right? They've got a great brand. They built uh, um, and they you know they they built a loyal customer. They've come through certainly some you know very you know, bad times in terms of, you know, food safety issues that they had early on. Uh, but, you know, they, they built out their digital capabilities uh, on the app, which has been great. Starbucks is another one, obviously. But what Chipotle is now doing and just going back to is, you know, they're going back to the drive. You know, they every every Chipotle, the decision is, is there a drive through a drive through opportunity before we renew this store? So, you know, from that standpoint, you, you can't be afraid to, to innovate in it, if it works for your brand. The, the focus of this paper is both retail and hospitality. So it, it encompasses many types of brands. And if I think about those two categories of retail, a retail experience and the hospitality side of business, then if, if we look at indicators, say over the last three to five years, of a Grubhub type model showing us that the customer experience has vacated a restaurant and part, part of it has and has pulled it into the home. If, if we're trying to find predictabilities in where the future goes, then the predictability in that is then we need to, as restaurant brands, we need to elevate our packaging so that the product is as close to as ready coming from a kitchen by the time it gets to the home. And from a hospitality standpoint, we have to look at fees because we were charging for an experience within our restaurant and part of that experience has been taken out of, um, out of our four walls. So if I'm looking at that as, as me and saying, all right, those are indicators of here's where the future may go, that the hospitality experience needs to translate into the home, whether that's a handwritten thank you note on the bag as a starting point to show that, um, or it's the way that I've packaged that food to stay hot and ready. And if we also look at some of the first party delivery brands like pizza, they've been innovating around how do we get that product as close to out of the oven as possible. For brands that are out there that are trying to see, like, what are the indicators? Would you got with the two of you and Philippe? I'll start with you. Would you agree that that's the kind of stuff that you need to be looking at as a brand to start having predictability on what you need to do in the future? Uh, Philippe, I'll start with you, and then I'll go to David. Yeah. So I think what is important is how your guests are going to use the brand. Uh, I, I was speaking uh, last week uh, with uh, one of the peers with whom uh, I'm speaking on a regular basis, and he was telling me that the food that is getting nowadays to the COVID period uh, as, as a delivery food, actually, uh, so they, they are close to a beach. So they take the food and they go to a picnic table uh, close to the beach. And they have a different experience than the one that they would have had in the restaurant. But sometimes they find that it's even a better experience because the setup that they have created 
uh, around the way they consume that brand is different and fits well between the food and the brand. So, uh, for example, if you, if you take a, a food deliver to home uh, for a dinner where the family, again, is having discussion together, I think family discussion are extremely important. And, how the food that you are delivering is going to be a good contributor uh, to that family experience. So I think that overall, there can be a great experience also outside of the restaurant. Uh, and, and you need to be a contributor to that experience. And it's going to go back to uh, discussing and listening to the guests and understand how they consume our brand. And David, opinions? Yeah, I, I would agree with, you know, I would agree with Philippe. I, 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 this, listen, I don't think there's going to be a wholesale. Of, I, I think Grubhub and, and the Uber Eats and all of that stuff has been nice and it's been great and it's served its purpose during a, you know, a, an event that's, you know, that, that was a black swan event. Um, and I think it probably has some legs, but at the end of the day, people still want to, you know, be with other people. I and mean, I think we all, we're relieved, or at least I know our family was like, hey, we can actually go out to eat again and we can actually interact with people and we can actually, you know, have that, you know, somebody serve us the food and it comes hot and, and you know, we can have conversations and a drink while we're having it. And so, you know, so I, I, I don't think people are going to wholesale abandoned restaurants. I don't think they're all going to go to delivery and this, we're going to only eat out of our homes. I mean, you know, we've seen this movie before, right? I mean, the, the, you know, video stores were going to kill the movie theaters and, they, and TV was going to kill the movie theaters and COVID may have killed the movie theaters. But, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, that. So so I just think it's just another way to and packaging, as you pointed out, is a way to extend your brand experience. Nobody really likes the black styrofoam crappy packaging. You know, when I get something from um uh, BWR, it's, you know, sturdy plastic. I can actually reuse these things. Um, they're recyclable. Uh, it, 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 it's hot. Uh, it proves it. And I think there's only going to be, you know, uh, innovations in that, you know, maybe it's, you know, very customized packaging. Again, I point back to how Apple um, and, and everybody stole that from Apple, right? If you order something from, we, we ordered a bunch of Google home things in our things. It was packaged the exact same way Apple packages their iPhones. So I, I do think that's another way just to extend the extend the brand experience. Yeah, I mean, there's there's going to be innovation that comes out of any, any crisis. I think that there's a key term there. And if the leadership has the right mentality to say, let's go ahead and shake things up and find what those gaps are, then opportunities can be owned. If we take, for instance, beliefs reference of the meal being at a picnic table when you've ordered it from a Grubhub or Uber Eats to get over there, now, the restaurant should be thinking about a few things. One, is the price point still aligned with the expectations of the customer? Because you still have to match up the economics. Uh, I've seen in Chicago, I've seen restaurants start ad adding a COVID uh, tax to the bill. Um, that, that, is, that is something that needs to be properly communicated with the customer to make sure that you're, you're establishing the expectation from a price standpoint. And now if you think about it and you take that insight of the experience was even better at that picnic table because of the setting that the customer set up, then maybe there's something in the delivery of the forks and the knives and the napkin. And then David, off of what you were saying, uh, I, I was envisioning even the delivery, if you think of a hotel brand, and you show up with room service, it's in the it's in the tin and you open it up as an experience to try to elevate uh, the fact that the food has come all the way over here and we've kept it hot and it hasn't been touched and here you go. So uh, all of this, all of this is shaking up um, probably where innovation will go and what potential best practices are. Um, I want to I want to rotate. Uh, the discussion a little bit to the workspace and the workspace is going to happen in retail hospitality and just in general uh, corporate climates. Uh, Philippe, because you are the author of this paper uh, that is published on 1851 titled The Future of Retail and Hospitality, um, I would love for you to put some context around the workspace and some of the things that you see happening in the future there. So I, I think that has been a, a very uh, interesting topic during the last three months. 
Uh, it happens that at home, my wife has been working from home for, for the last uh, 10 years almost. Uh, and in our company, we were very much proponent that we, you had to be at work every day so that the interaction, the brainstorming, the discussion would lead to greater ideas and better implementation. Uh, I have been extremely surprised how quickly the majority uh, of uh, employees have been able to work from home. I'm not saying all of them, but so one, uh, we have a lot of tools that allows with a very limited cost to have efficient meetings like uh, Skype, uh, Zoom. Uh, and also after a while, I'm going to be very frank with the audience. It took me about two weeks to get uh, reorganized uh, because I was going at the office every day and thinking that I had to be at the office every day. And then uh, after two weeks, I, I reorganized completely my pattern and bec became very effective the, the work uh, in the work from home uh, mindset. I know that some employees, uh, perhaps a minority, they were a little bit more struggling because they, they were more looking for that daily interaction. So being at home, they felt that there was something missing. Uh, if we think about the future, uh, so for example, I, I've seen in real estate that the new buildings that are being built, they have in the lobby, there is a special uh, Amazon uh, style box where you can receive your uh, bigger boxes uh, and they're safe and you can collect them. Uh, uh, some, of the, some of the staff members they have discovered that when they are at home, they need also uh, a quiet place where they can work in an uninterrupted manner. So in the same manner that today when you want to, to lease or to buy uh, a condo, you are looking at the number of bedrooms. And then, of course, it's implied that there is a kitchen and a, a dining room uh, and a living room. But perhaps in the future, there will be also a desk study then, uh, which uh, will, a space which will allow people to work in a very productive manner from, uh, from home. And even though, you know, I, I am very blessed because I have a commute which is short, it's about 20, 25 minutes. But between the time to pack, unpack the 25 minutes both ways, it's about two hours uh, that I was uh, saving per day and that I could reallocate to work. So a very big impact for me. David, do you want to provide some thoughts on the workspace as well? Sure. Uh, I'll give you my personal view. And you know, kind of what my peers in the real estate industry are talking about. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a, it's a nice fantasy that people like to work from home. I, I personally have a incredible setup. I have a carriage house with an office above it, hardwired. I have everything I need uh, short of a bunker. And uh, I hated it. You know, I, I want to be in the office. Uh, I want to be with my partners. I want to have that interaction. Um, and uh, I enjoy the um, sociability of work. And um, I, so, you know, so for me personally, I, I'm in my office today. I couldn't wait to get back. I, I want to have that separation from, from home to, uh, from home to, uh, to, to office. Um, I also think there's some social capital that you gain from being at work amongst your peers. Uh, the mindset and, you know, we can have all the Zoom calls we want. Um, I have an executive coach uh, who I've been with for years and he wanted to do a Zoom call. I said, I'm not doing one more Zoom call. Like I do, that doesn't work for the interaction that I need with my coach. It works on a business standpoint. If we need to have a conference call, I don't have to go to Florida, but I don't think it works on the personal standpoint. I do think you will probably see more spacing, uh, you know, and uh, probably the redesign of uh, uh, this is like the, this is like the, the, the architect's uh, fantasy because now they get to redesign all their office uh, spaces for their clients. Uh, but I, I think it's important that, uh, I think it's important for our cities uh, and I think it's important uh, for the mental health of people to, you know, to be in the office amongst their peers um, as opposed to cooped up at home. So that's just my, my take. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I wanna put uh, some, some 
context around some of the things that you're saying or, or some additional opinions. Um, and that's on, on the workspace. Uh, I find it interesting. I, I've never been someone that would want to work from home. I, I too have had the need to go into an office. Um, but to Philippe's point, when you think about commuters, uh, call it call it two hours, call it an hour. Um, in a world that has taught many that life is short, you're trying to maximize the value of each day and to get that hour back, whether you choose to put it into work or you choose it to put into personal, that seems to be a discussion that is going to continue happening. Based on um, the demographics, uh, the age of the employee, that also seems to swing the direction of where does the future of the workplace go? Um, and it, it, the reality is it, there's so many different opinions about it, it's gonna be hard to land uh, in a best case scenario. The other interesting thing, if we think about just space in general, uh, in Chicago, the restaurants are reopening uh, primarily with outdoor seating uh, because it gives them a little bit more room to have social distancing on the tables. In a world where we're pressing down on decreasing the size of restaurant real estate, should something like this happen again that would require social distancing, capacity issues also come into play. So in offices that have battled through layoffs that may have gone into pre-COVID at 50 people and now have 25, now all of a sudden their unit is actually set up well for a social distancing world. So when you start thinking about all this stuff, whether it's vacating offices vacating cities for much of what has happened during COVID and now recent recent situations, um, is it is it tough to get predictability on it? Um, the the and the last statement, David, because I would love for you to to provide this opinion too. There was a point where after September 11. Uh, the world said uh, nobody would come back to the Sears Tower, uh, that it would be empty ghost town. Five years later, mm. past 11th, Sears Tower is at full occupancy. So is it, do people start jumping to conclusions too fast? And is there a time frame that you have to wait to actually have a best practice when it comes to workspace or space in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, right. I mean, no, but it, it, it's, it's, it's easy to make, you know, vast sweeping predictions, but the reality tells us that that doesn't happen. And after 9-11, now there'll be some tweaks, right? But after 9-11, no one's going back to New York either, right? And then it became a hotbed of, 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 of uh, tourism and, and, and people that want to live there. And still, you know, people still, young people still want to, still want to live there. So, um, yes, I, I think it's too early to tell and you have to see what happens. And, and, and frankly, you know, you know, probably get in trouble for saying this, we don't know that social distancing, I mean, we, we think it flattened the curve. <laughs> the riots may prove differently, right? You know, so, you know, we don't know that the social distancing is actually, you know, gonna, you know, is, is working as well as we think. I mean, it, it seems to have, it seems to have gotten it, but, you know, is that really the, is the, is the, is the cure, you know, more, uh, is cure worse than the, the disease? So um, the answer is is nobody you know nobody nobody really knows and uh, we're we're figuring it out as 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 we go along. And Philippe, comments? Yeah, uh, I agree completely with uh, with David. So uh, uh, key changes are going to evolve slowly. Typically, that's what we have seen. It, it, it's very rare to have brutal changes. So, for example, if you look at the way the internet was introduced and people buying online, it was a couple of percent every year. So, if, if we study how people are going to, to start to work more at home and less at the office, perhaps there will be a trend of one or two percent. Uh, what is important is to understand the direction. I, I also like uh, what they've said many times, we don't know. Uh, so it goes back to the flexibility. Uh, here at Buffalo Wings and Ring, we were fairly firm not working from home. So now we are starting to introduce some flexibility. 
but it doesn't mean that thing, the pendulum is going to swing in a brutal manner. Yeah, I, I, I just want to add one more thing. I mean, people, yeah, go for it. people are social animals. I mean, they, they really are. We, we're not made. We were we were made made to gather together and to be together, and that's better for us. You know, from a, from a mental health standpoint, I, I get the physical health, but from a mental health standpoint, it's good to be around other people to have to have that. And so, you know, um, I think it would be tragic if if all of a sudden mm -hmm. all of our caves, you know, huddled together and, and we never got, and, and at some point, you know, um, you know, we're going to have to, you know, decide that, you know, listen, we have a personal responsibility. So if you're a, if you're a person that, um, is a, uh, more susceptible to, a, 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 a to a COVID or a, whatever the next, you know, issue is, you know, then you shouldn't put yourself in that situation. It's like the alcoholic, right? He shouldn't be a bartender. You know, he, he needs to be removed. So, you know, but but I certainly hope that we go back to you know crowded bars and crowded restaurants and 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 football and baseball and soccer and all the concerts and all of those things. And it, it, you know, we need to have some sense of personal responsibility. Like I can't be in that crowd because I'm susceptible. I could get it. But for the most part. You know, we we shouldn't. You know, I, I don't think we should let fear rule us. You said there's a key term there. You said I hope this gets back. Is it as, as you're looking at predictability uh, or the future or AI or data? Is there any part of you, David, that you're scared that this doesn't come back? And then, secondly, does that then open up opportunity to figure out what does? No, I think it comes back. I think people are just desperate to to get out and be mm -hmm. and have some sense of 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 normal normalcy. Now, but there will be tweaks, right? Look at what happened after 9-11. There are tweaks. Now we take off our shoes or you know, now we can't bring water on the plane or or through security. And and there's gonna be some tweaks. So maybe we'll have some maybe we'll just do temperature checks before you come in the restaurant. That'll just be a normal, a normal, a normal thing. And it's not too weird to see people with masks on from November to January because of that. So I, yes, but I think in, in general, I think it's going to come back. I mean, for, you know, our, our whole economy is, is, you know, the world economy is based on, you know, tourism and gathering together and, you know, getting, you know, masses of people together. So we need, it has like, we don't have a choice. Philippe, any opinions you want to add? Yeah, uh, and I think the 9-11 uh, event is, is an interesting one. How, how impactful it was to the U.S., I would say that today the only uh, decision that has been long-lasting uh, has been the security uh, procedure be before we board the plane. Uh, nobody would have predicted uh, the day of 9-11 that that would be the, the only thing. Uh, think about the AIDS, you know, um, in, in the 70s or early 80s. Well, you know, there was more freedom, sexual freedom. Think that, that has, uh, it's not that people have stopped, you know, being together. Uh, it's just that they are protected today. So very likely one or two things will stay out of the COVID crisis. And again, uh, as Dave said, nobody knows. Uh, but you need to be flexible and vigilant so that you you are able to uh, to follow and somewhere anticipate what will be those few things uh, that will remain for good. Let's rotate a little bit to the, the end of your paper talks about the readiness plan for the long term. And I believe this is where great businesses are born out of when you're thinking far enough in advance to prepare and protect against the storms that come up. Uh, every storm will eventually run out of rain. And if we're there to now own the recovery or own the opportunity or predictability, we're thinking about some of the direction this stuff will go, then as businesses, we should be well positioned to actually have a thriving business in the future. So, Philippe, do you want to put just some context around this part of the paper and what that means for businesses? Yeah. So, uh, the, the, there is the theory of Darwin on the evolution of uh, 
species. And basically, Darwin is saying that it's not the strongest or the, the smartest, but the most adaptive that have been living the longest. Uh, it's the same uh, in business. For example, if you look nowadays, the tenure of companies in the Dow Jones uh, become shorter and shorter. The, the, the mega companies of the 80s, most of them have disappeared. So the, there, is, there is a rotation uh, in the leadership uh, of the category where you are. The, the second thing, which I think is very important for uh, the, the leaders that are listening to us, is the difference between the future and your future. It, uh, whatever size of the business or department uh, you, you are uh, responsible of, I think it's interesting to know what is going to be the future of the society in general. But uh, as responsible uh, manager, director, business owner, uh, you need to be very careful of your future. So the, one of the reasons why I put together this paper is that people are attentive to what is going to impact their future. And David, do you want to put some thoughts around readiness plan for the long term? Yeah, I think you. Uh, you, you, you I think history can can offer some comfort. You know, I, there's a great little meme, not a meme, but a little thing that's going on. And if you were born in 1900, think about your life, right? You were 14, World War One start, you're 19, 50 million people die in a flu pandemic, you're 30, you know, we go, or 29, you go into a, a, the depression, uh, you know, you're 40, World War Two. you know, you're 63, you know, president gets shot, I mean, blah, blah, blah. So the history, I actually can, can offer some, some comfort. One of my, one of my book, Books that I read during during COVID was the uh, Splendid and the Vile, which is uh, about the bombing of of, of London uh, by uh, by Hitler. And, and 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 you know we've been through crises before. We've been through this before. And so you have to look and say, okay, you know what does the you know so and we've survived them, right? Uh, humanity has gone on. The world's gone on. So, you know, I, I, I then look like, okay, so what's the future going to look like? You know, do I, when, when we look at a shopping center to buy, we think to ourselves, does this concept have legs? And, you know, will it, uh, you know, will it, were they able to adapt? I, I looked, were they willing, willing, able to adapt during this, this bad time? And, you know, and, and, and what could, could affect that? You know, on the going, on the going forward, on a going forward basis. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I guarantee you, there's some franchise company out there, franchise or that's thinking of things that we never thought of. You know, and uh, you know that's going to come out of this, come out of this crisis. I don't know what it is, um, but I, I suspect uh, there's going to be, you know, a great rebirth of, you know, opportunities because you know humans are creative and, you know, and uh, um, and they're going to be able to, you know, fig figure things out. Yeah, uh, a few comments, um, and then if either of you have any follow-ups on this, um, great. So I think about McDonald's, and McDonald's menu today versus McDonald's menu at the beginning is vastly different. But the reality is what McDonald's became good at is operational consistency at burgers, fries, and shakes, and that's it. And you had your expectations as a customer, no, no matter where you were, it kept on getting great burgers, great fries, great shakes that all tasted the same. And you think about the operational excellence, even, even applied to that today, you can still go to McDonald's and get a great burger, fry, or shake. So if history shows you some things about business, consistency should still rule as time goes on. So finding the things that can withstand time ends up being good for franchise brands, but sometimes the, the new shiny thing, such as when self-serve frozen yogurt jumped on the, on the scene and everybody rushed out to buy self-serve yo frozen yogurt franchises because it was a new innovative thing because it allowed the guests to go serve themselves as much ice cream as they wanted, there was still some good things in there. What did it teach us? It taught us, yeah, Chipotle is right. The customer wants 
in control of their experience. Do not judge me for wanting six more scoops of chicken on my salad. It's not up to you. I am in control, Mr. and Mrs. Restaurant. So if we look at some of the baseline, we establish foundational excellence and operations in, in consistency. I think that's important. The other thing that's interesting is, uh, and I've been looking a lot into this, is the concept of backcasting that you pick a date in the future, whether it's the end of 2021, and your business is it, it's out of business, you've gone under, and you think through that moment for a second, and you pause and you say, what would I have done differently? Maybe it's I would have laid people off. Maybe I wouldn't have had a hard stance and I'm not laying people off. Maybe I would have changed my food pricing. Maybe I would have closed down these locations. But when you go through that exercise as your business is closed, that might give you some predictabilities that you might make the adjustment. Now, the other thing that it could do is my business is thriving at the end of 2021. What have I done to get there? Maybe it is innovation. Maybe it's innovation and in packaging. Maybe it is a ghost kitchen. But you write down these things and you start trying to find this pinpoint in the future so that you can have some sort of mentality on what this looks like so that when you're when you're going through it, you've at least started laying out some groundwork um, to get you there. The, the problem with history is if we take 2008, nine and 10, where so many businesses got punched in the gut, they forgot to write down those things and they get to 2020 when COVID hits. And they they somehow the memory loss happened that rainy days don't happen, and they were fat and hungry. They might have been over fat fat and happy. They were over leveraged, and those are the businesses that David at the start of this you said there will be businesses that don't make it, and it's because of not being able to learn from history and grow as human beings. Um, David, I'll start with you. Any comments off of what I'm saying, and then Philippe, I'll go over to you. Yeah, it's funny, you, you know, I've seen frozen yogurt was not a new thing, right? I mean, I've seen frozen yogurt in 25 years. You know, well, that's our joke, right? We were like, like when we buy a shopping center, we lose the frozen yogurt guy because we're always going to lose the frozen yogurt guy. It comes and goes, it comes and goes. It comes. <laughs> and so I, I think you have to, you know, the, the, the world is, is much more, um, a lot of people would argue this, but, you know, the world is much more intelligent now. I mean, anything you want is on Google. You can... The, the consumer is much more, you know, in, informed. And so, you know, you have to, and, and really there's so many more critics and people that call you out. And, and so, yeah, I think the more authentic you are, I think authenticity is going to be the new future. And the more authentic you are in your brand, McDonald's is very authentic. Consistency in their authentic, authenticity. You don't, you know, Chipotle, I think is some of the great brands. And I think the, and I think, BWR has has done a tremendous job, you know, being an authentic brand. And so I think the more authentic you are, uh, that's probably what I would be, you know, concentrating on because that relates to the people are just desperate, I think, for that kind of trust and and to trust in someone and authenticity uh, in, in whatever experience they're, you know, they're having. And so that to me is 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 really the is really the, the the future, and if I think if you look at the successful companies that have been, you know, through, you know, through all the, the bad times, and you know, they're authentic, they're authentic brands uh, that you know whether or not they stumbled or fell, you know, but they they re, they remain true to kind of who they were as 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 authentic brands. I think that that's a great term to use, um, Philippe. Any comments? Yeah, perhaps two comments. So one, I think some, sometimes what is bad is the short-term pressure on profit. Uh, unfortunately, in our industry, uh, we, we have uh, a lot of VC money. Uh, we have also public, uh, publicly traded companies uh, that report quarterly uh, result uh, on Wall Street. And uh, sometimes you lose the long-term focus for... Uh, those very short term profit. Uh, so you are not making the best decision for uh, the long term of the brand. And the, the, the second thing is uh, the adjustment. And that was uh, Robert Crescenti's question earlier. I would compare that. So for those who are a little bit older like me, 
Do you remember when we have those radios where you would uh, fine tune? So it was doing, and then suddenly the music would uh, play. So a minor change in the tuning was going from a sound that was not good at all to a good quality of voice and music. And, and I think as a, a manager and leaders of our businesses, we, we need to work on the small refinement until we get the sound. And because suddenly, especially for those who are a little bit technical, you know, uh, the growth is exponential when you have the quality sound. If we were, if we were watching this, let, let's pick a date. Let's pick uh, end of 2021. And the three of us decide we're gonna go watch this and look at some predictabilities. And I know this is not deep into the future, but I think it's relevant um, for businesses that are still navigating uh, a, a very, very turbulent business climate. Um, just some general predictions on what happens, say over the next 18 months. Uh, David, I'll start with you. Uh, well, yeah, I'll give you a, a couple. Uh, you know, some of it depends, right? I mean, we're we're. Um, I think one uh, from a macro perspective, I think you're going to see re onshoring supply. Everyone's going to learn not to be just dependent on one source, specifically China. You know, for for their for their supply chain. So I think you're going to see diversity of supply chain and stuff that's considered national um, of national security importance being brought here specifically medical which I think will be great for the, for the US I think it'll be great for the Southeast because they tend to be business friendly uh, and um, Southeastern United States uh, and there's still some growth down there um, two I think you'll see which will be a great thing the end of private equity not the end but <laughs> certainly the decimation of private equity in retail because they're gonna figure out they've figured out how hard it is it wasn't just levering these uh, things up, paying themselves big dividends, uh, and then letting the stores limp limp along. Uh, and you know, private equity has a problem getting uh, brands to be authentic. Uh, so I think you're going to see a lot less of those players uh, in in you know in in the marketplace. And I think you will uh, see you know from a standpoint of the you know the the stores are going to say, you know, maybe we don't need to be as big as we were and we got to be closer to the neighborhood uh, and be in the neighborhood, you know, with the people as opposed to the outline. And the last thing I'd add is I think there's going to be um, probably there's 1200 malls in the United States um, <clears throat> be, um, at the end of five years. And I know we were only talking 18 months, but five years, uh, there'll be 200 malls and that'll be it. Uh, because that 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 trade is over. Very fascinating, Philippe. Comments on future? Yeah. So the one of the recurring theme in my paper is that I'm not trying to predict. I don't have a crystal ball, as they say. A lot of people don't know. So I think if there is a takeaway, is that people need to be to be vigilant and also to be careful to people who say. It's going to be like that. It's going to be like that uh, because actually nobody knows. But just be careful every day and have a flexible organization that can try the different options that you understand uh, are uh, uh, interacting with your business. Uh, I, I, I agree uh, with Dave when he's speaking about the number of small. I don't know exactly the... The, the number. But one thing which is sure is that some businesses are not going to make it, unfortunately, through the COVID crisis. So for those who are staying, it's going to be a bigger market share. So it's similar to the to the joke when you have two, two guys who are running in the savannah and there is a, a lion who is running after them. And one of the two guys uh, stop and change his shoes. He put a uh, gym shoes and the other is laughing, saying, oh, don't think that you are going to outrun the lion. But, and the guy with the gym shoes on <laughs> I'm going to outrun you. Yeah. So for, for those that, we, that will be still in business, let's say in the fall of 2020, I think that uh, fortunately for us, unfortunately for the other, 
We are just going to enjoy higher volume because of the, 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 uh, the competitor businesses that will not reopen. I think those are, those are great insights. Uh, my, my comments would be um, 2021, uh, my, my predictability is a lot of brands will look at vacating uh, social media. Um, I feel like humanity is going to go through some shifts. And when you talk about hospitality and retail, uh, that's gonna get exposed there too. Uh, right now, uh, the consumer's limitations of uh, retribution on poor behaviors uh, from a hospitality standpoint are limited to a Google or a Facebook review. I think that's going to change uh, slightly. Um, so I, my, my predictability is one, um, we're, lear we're learning faster than we've ever learned as a society on very important topics, that's gonna cause change. Um, and two, I think something's gonna give in kindness. I don't know what that means, um, but I think brands are gonna need to think about uh, the behaviors, the in-person behaviors. Um, brands that, are, that have taken the retail experience away from human to human interaction and have turned it into e-commerce, um, are going to have to also find what is the intersection of, of human and technology uh, because I don't believe the business world or humans are ready uh, to go full robot or full automation. Uh, and that goes back to some of David's statements on we are social human beings. We need to be around people. And there's going to be something down the middle that connects and bridges all this together. And whoever can figure that out, uh, that that's the next Elon Musk or the next, uh, you know, great, great, great business person. Well, it's very, it's very interesting. It's, it's very interesting. You know, Amazon is investing in brick and mortar, right? They're investing. You know, they bought Whole Foods. They're opening grocery stores. You know, the, you know, they, 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 they understand that stores and are important. It's very, very, very important. And, um, you know, even Kohl's, you know, who have a much touted digital strategy, you know, is finding out that, you know, it's very expensive to do just online. You know, you need the customer, you know, to come into the store. So, yeah, I mean, if you think about uh, the Truman Show, where right. Jim Carrey is stuck on this island, his whole dream is to figure out what's on the other side. But even though we've been confined to our homes due to circumstance, we want to know what's out there. And there's going to be something on the retail side or the restaurant side. We still want to get out. We still need that break from our homes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the, the bottom line is uh, Philippe's paper, like he said, it's not designed to be predictable. It's not the crystal ball. It's designed to get the discussion going and for your leadership team to start thinking about what that might mean in the future. Um, gentlemen, we've hit the hour. Uh, I wanna thank you for this time. It's gonna be a topic that we'll keep talking about. I predict we'll talk about it in the future. Uh, write that down is correct for Nick, um, but I appreciate it. Uh, for everybody that's, that's watching at home, you can go on 1851 to read the paper. It's going to be something that we update as things go on. Please join in the conversation. Everybody have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye.